Greetings AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we are going to take a look at topic three out of unit five. And we're gonna be dealing with our first example and a bit of an introduction to what, what uh, this topic is, is trying to convey. And really it's about determining if a function is going to increase or decrease. And depending on your pre-calculus, college algebra background, it's very possible that you may have been exposed to this, uh, which is great because it's gonna make a lot more sense, I think, uh, for, for those of you who have had that background and you're going to be able to probably attach yourselves to it a little bit quicker. But if you have never dealt with intervals of increasing and decreasing, I think that this is gonna be a pretty simple thing for you as long as you know how to take a derivative. So let's take a peek at 5.3. So what I've got here, first of all, in this box is the official definitions of increasing and decreasing. And it's very important that you note that these definitions are not calculus related. They are algebraic. So any student who has a basic understanding of probably first year algebra could wrap their heads around this definition fairly easy. And it says a function f is increasing on some interval. If for any two numbers, let's say x1 and x2 that are in that interval, x1 being less than x2 implies that the f of x1 value is less than the f of x2 value. So you're basically saying that if you've got two x's, then the first x's y value is smaller than the second x's y value. And boom, there you've got this increasing behavior. And if you throw in lots and lots and lots of points, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, and have that same relationship, you build yourself some points that just simply look like this and are thus increasing. So you can see there's no derivative in this. There's no calculus of any sort. The definition for decreasing is very similar, except if that x1 less than 2 relationship is still intact, then we have a switch of the inequality sign. That means the y value of the, of the first value is greater than the y value of the second value, and thus you have something that might look like that. Now, the problem with that is that it's very difficult to work with in an analytical structure, because we're not just going to like find all these infinite number of x's. I mean, that's just insane. How do we do that and compare them? So what we can do instead is think about the behavior of the derivative. And that behavior of the derivative is illustrated in this little graph I have off to the right. And as you can see, there's a decreasing portion of this graph, a constant part, because that is the third possibility. A graph could be constant. And then there's an increasing portion. Well, if you take a look at the behaviors of the derivative, it pretty much sets the stage. So what do you know about the derivative along a decreasing part of a graph? Well, the slopes of the tangent line, aka derivative, certainly are negative values, right? Those slopes are going downhill. And so that is what is happening right here. On the other side of this, where the curve is increasing, you can certainly see that the slopes of these tangent lines that could be fixed anywhere have positive values. <clears throat> now, it's probably, you know, very, very logical that any place along the graph where you have a horizontal line segment, that derivative would be zero, of course, and thus we call that a constant, which is not going to be real common among the behavior of a function over its entire interval but it is a possibility, so therefore we wanted to talk about it. So if I take that idea just from that graph, I can transform that into a theorem that gives us our tests for increasing and decreasing. And we just simply have to have a function f that is continuous on a closed interval a, b, and differentiable on an open interval a, b. That kind of sets the stage for a lot of our theorems lately. And it says if the first derivative of f is positive for all x's in that open interval, then we say that f is increasing. If we have the first derivative that's negative for all the x's in that open interval, then we're going to say that f is decreasing, and it's that simple. 
So if we take a look at our first example here, and this is kind of an unusual example. It's one that's very conceptual oriented. We'll take a look at a few that are actually a little bit more algebraic that actually require us to maybe take a derivative and work with it. We're going to have plenty of time to do that. But for right now, I'd like to take a look at this guy. It says the graph shown to the right is a graph of f prime. And boy, we, we want to make sure we know that. That's really important. It's kind of hard to miss. <laughs> the derivative of f of x. Use this graph, find the critical values of f of x, and state the intervals over which f of x is increasing and decreasing, and justify your answer. Well, if you remember back a section ago, a topic ago, we already talked about critical values. And that's a very important building block of all of the knowledge that you're going to gain and use here in Unit 5. And if you remember, critical values occur whenever your derivative is equal to 0, or possibly if your derivative is undefined. Well, in this particular case, our graph is our derivative. So to determine when this graph is equal to 0, we just merely need to figure out where does this graph cross the x-axis. And we see that it does so at four different, or three different values. I can't count there. Three different values. And those values would be, of course, 0, 2, and 4. Now, f prime being undefined is something that we don't really have to worry about because this graph is continuous everywhere. There's no holes, breaks, or asymptotes. So therefore, this is not going to have any more additional solutions. So we have these three critical values. Those critical values are what help determine the intervals over which your function is going to increase and decrease. So just to the left of 0, we might even think about putting together Maybe a number line. We could start doing that. It's, it's never too early to do that. And we could place those particular critical numbers on that number line. And we could start thinking about, OK, well, what's the sign of f prime? Well, if you go to the left of 0, we can clearly see that f prime is negative there. And so there's no argument there that we're certainly negative. And what that means is that the behavior of f is going to be that of decreasing behavior. And I'm just going to, going to abbreviate it right there. Between 0 and 2, we see that that behavior is going to change where f prime is a positive value, which means we have increasing behavior. And between 2 and 3, we're clearly negative with our f prime. So we have decreasing behavior. And then beyond 4, you can see that we have, again, positive behavior for f prime, and thus we're increasing. Now remember, what we're looking at is what is the sign of the curve. You're not drawing like tangent lines or anything to this curve because this is already the derivative. So you're just looking at where this curve lies above or below the x-axis. Now, it's very important that you understand something now, and I'm going to explain this many times over. What I've just drawn here, this wonderful number line with all of this important data and this information. These are typically never scored on the AP exam. In other words, you're not going to get points for those. Oftentimes, the, the readers were, were, were often told to neglect that. Of course, we have to read everything that's on your paper, but it is extremely rare that any points can come from that sign chart. And that's kind of what we call this. Even though it's a number line, this is often referred to as a sign chart. It's just a way to organize your signs. What you would have to do is interpret that verbally. And that's what's going to give you your full credit. And then don't forget, we have to do a little bit of justification here as well. And I'm going to show you exactly how to go about doing that. So what we're going to do is state the intervals over which f is increasing, decreasing. It doesn't matter which one you go with first. So we can start with the decreasing, let's say. So we'll say f of x is decreasing. And you want to make sure that you call this f of x. Don't say f prime of x. And then list the intervals. And the intervals start with negative infinity. And they go on to 0. 
And then here's where you can make a, a choice. And I don't want to, to, to draw this out, but it really doesn't matter on the AP exam if you put a bracket or a parenthesis around these endpoints. Obviously, negative infinity and infinity has to have an open parenthesis. It doesn't make any difference. Different authors of different books tend to disagree in the way that they define the increasing, decreasing behavior. Can you increase, decrease up to it at a point? The majority of the textbooks are starting to go with a little bit more of uh, the, the bracket approach. And that seems to be what you see a lot on the scoring rubrics for the AP Calc exam. But we are going to go ahead and accept either one. I want to be consistent with my students, so I'm going to always use these brackets. But then I'm just going to separate these with commas. And the next time that I have an interval that has a positive behavior for F is right there between, uh, I'm sorry, a negative behavior for F is between 2 and 4. And note the usage of um, the brackets. Now I want to make sure I give a reason. And my reason would be because F prime of X is less than 0. And I can say on those intervals. If you don't add the phrase on those intervals, it's not the worst thing in the world because we would assume that's what you mean, but it's nice to be a little bit more thorough with that. And then basically you're going to write a very similar statement for the increasing behavior. Obviously, we're going to have some different intervals. <laughs> so the intervals of increasing are going to start between 1 and 2. Again, I'm going to go ahead and elect to use the brackets. And then again, on, I could use the word and, or I could use the comma. You want to try not to use things like the intersection symbol. There's a bit of ambiguity that can happen if you use that. Um, and the reason is that if you use a union, you kind of suggest that the increasing behavior is starting from the very, very front of the first interval and continues to the very end of the last interval. And so I'm not a big fan of that. So let's either use commas or the word and here. And then we've got the rationale, which is because F prime is positive. And you could say once again on those intervals. And that takes care of the solution to your example one. You're going to be doing this quite a bit, developing this idea of the sign chart and then writing the answer in some kind of a verbal format. The only thing that's going to change is the way that the information is provided here. I think we caught a bit of a break because all of the derivative work was done for us, but in some of our future examples, we're going to have to tackle that as well. Be sure to check those videos out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.